Hello everyone, here's what we're grateful for. My mom and dad. My dad. My family. My pets. Sewing. Our church. I'm grateful that we have a kitchen and the money to buy ingredients for cooking. Well, I'd be very bored. I'm grateful for our garden that we can play in. I'm grateful for our dog that I can play with. I'm grateful for my family, which I can have a lot of company with and have a fun time. I'm also grateful for my warm bed, like a lot of others don't have. I'm grateful for my boys, who all of them, and especially these two, who have been playing so nicely together. And um, I'm also glad I get to leave the house and go to work and help people at work. Um, and I'm also grateful for Auntie Gladys, who looks after the boys and um, has agreed to stay for lockdown with us. I'm grateful for the family to have in this terrible time where we can't go and do anything with people. Good morning, church family. I am so grateful for my friend who this week informed me that he gave his life to the Lord. Hi everybody, um, we're very thankful for God's provision during this time and just sending love to you all and hope you're all staying safe during this season. Um, lots of love. Bye. We are grateful for family. Hi church, I'm extremely grateful for my wonderful husband Mike and for my beautiful healthy baby girl Jean. And I hope that you're all doing well and I can't wait to meet again and fellowship with all of you. Lots of love. Bye. Hello, Christchurch Cascades. We are very, very grateful for the Lord's provision in these times. And we are very grateful for the community that we miss so much. And um, all the people and getting to see everyone every Sunday. Yeah, we're very grateful for friendships as well. And that growth groups could start virtually. Um, that has been great. And then we also just want to say happy birthday to Cindy for Saturday. Bye. Gather around and get to your seats or your couches and get comfortable. Hello kids, I have missed you all so much. Your excited faces and loud singing. I hope you are singing as loudly during these online services. I do not have Easter eggs for you to count, but let's try and count and see how many people contributed to this online service. My name is Alberto and I am one of the elders of Christchurch Cascades and it's great to be able to share this time of virtual togetherness with you. We are so fortunate to be able to do this. Did you know that 115 computers logged in or downloaded our service last week? Is that not amazing? It's almost 50% more people than come to our physical services. If you are one of these visitors, you are most welcome. We hope you will join us together when we meet in person again at Athlone School. If you would like to make contact with Richard or Mandy, please do so via the website ChristChurchCascades.co.za. Last week we started our new sermon series, Upside Down. It highlights how Jesus did things 2,000 years ago, Society of the day did not expect. I dare say we currently would expect it even less. We saw how Jesus chose to dine and stay with the most loathed person, a tax collector. But Jesus called him, he repented and was saved. Jesus came to save the lost. The danger of course is that we think we are not as lost as Zacchaeus, the tax collector. But without hearing him call us and accepting God's love and grace, we are. We're going to open in prayer, thanking God for his love and grace. After that, we're going to sing together and thank you to the Thorps. The song we're going to sing is well known, but do not let the familiarity of the words distract from the beautiful meaning. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God 
Jesus, the Savior of the lost. Let's pray together. Our Father God, you are worthy of our praise. You are holy, good and loving of your people. We thank you for this meeting and the means you have provided for us to be able to join together like this. We thank you that in a world which is in turmoil, upside down, we can look to you for putting things right. Right with you and also with each other. We pray your presence is palpable here this afternoon. Speak to us clearly and into our broken hearts as your word is explained. In your name we pray. Amen. We have come to praise the one Who came down into our darkness For the lowly virgin son You who did not come with splendor Pomp and strength and majesty You who came to us in weakness Born to us in poverty to sing together. Thank you so much for leading us uh, in song, James and Renee. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Richard. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and I just wanted to let you in on some church family news. I'm sure you would have been so excited on Thursday evening to hear our president announce that lockdown restrictions will begin to ease from next week. It's obviously going to be a phased-in plan. We don't know what that's going to look like exactly and how long it's going to take uh, just yet. Um, But I want to encourage you in this time of, I guess, lockdown and as it slowly eases to 
to really spend time with God. You know, it's a, a wonderful truth that we might be isolated from one another, but we are not isolated from God. He is with us. He's given us His Word. His Holy Spirit is, is in us and works powerfully through His Word. And so come to Him. Uh, spend some time uh, each day uh, in His Word. Let Him encourage your heart, uh, challenge your heart, and grow you uh, in, this, in this season. And we've put together a couple of resources to help you do that. Uh, the first one are um, uh, some family devotionals, which are going to work alongside our, our Sunday services, particularly our Upside Down series. And so each Sunday, you'll get a message on our Christchurch Cascades WhatsApp group with a little family devotional. The idea is you gather the kids around the table and it's to get the kids involved um, with questions pertinent to the service and the passage that we've been working through. So expect one of those uh, every Sunday uh, through our Upside Down series. The second are our Daily Dose devotionals. We've got a 10-part series working through the Lord's Prayer, which is online. Um, we also have, and what launched this week, is a five-part series in Deuteronomy chapter 6 called One God, One Love, written by our very own Sheena Warren. Um, so go check those out. They're on our website, www.christchurchcascades.co.za. You'll see a little, a little resources uh, tab on the top right-hand side of the screen and uh, a little drop-down box uh, with daily dose devotionals and um, will pop up. So go make use of those uh, and get into God's Word uh, each day. Thirdly and lastly, our growth groups kicked off this week. And it was a huge encouragement uh, to be able to meet, again, not physically, but uh, over Zoom and Google Hangouts. And I want to encourage you to prioritize those meetings. Uh, do log in when your group is meeting. Spend some time I in a text together, encouraging one another from the Bible. And then just a great time just catching up and to pray for one another. Um, we emailed out material that we're working through this term. Again, it links in with the Upside Down series. If you didn't receive an email from the church, send me an email, richard at christchurchcascades.co.za, and I'll get that material through to you. Well, that's all from a church family news perspective. I'm going to hand you back over to Alberto. Thank you, Richard, Renee, and James. Did you notice the words of the song? You who with a word created would lie down on a tree, would bleed and die to set us free. Beautiful, isn't it? I have to say something about the virus. At the beginning of this disaster, we prayed for God to protect us and the people of Maritzburg and our country. Through various possible ways, we have been relatively saved from Spain, Italy and USA's calamity. And now we are on level four, starting to trend or turn back towards normality. It is far from over, and the effect will be with us for such a long time. But we have so much to be thankful to God for. So be encouraged, stay strong and take precautions, but look up. There is hope in this world and the next. Before Tembi leads us in prayer and Aliki reads from Mark's gospel for us, let's respond in corporate prayer, saying the Lord's Prayer together. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hello, church. My name is Utembi Isa. May we please bow our heads in prayer. Our dear loving Father, Good and gracious God, we come before you today with humility, seeking for your mercy and grace, O oh Father, during this time. We pray that you may comfort us, be our hope when we're feeling hopeless, be our joy in times of sorrow, and be our strength when we're feeling weak. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we do have a daddy that we can Go to any time of the day, any time of the month. 
any time of the year. And once again, Lord, we do come to you. We pray that you may be our healer in terms of these difficult times. Pray that you may comfort us and help us all to seek you, Father, when we don't understand what is happening around us. We know that you are sovereign over all things, nothing that catches you by surprise, O oh Father, and we know that even for this virus, you saw it coming, Lord. You are not surprised by it, O oh Father, and we know that you, are, you will conquer in your perfect timing, Father. As we suffer, Father, we do pray, O oh God, that this kind of suffering may bring us closer to you and marvel at your grace, O oh Father, that you are God, God, who promised in your way that you would never leave us nor forsake us, you would always be with us because you are loving and you are kind, you are gracious, you are merciful. We do pray, O oh gracious Father, that you may continue to be with our our president and his colleagues at large in these difficult times. Thank you that he's been leading us, O oh Lord, with such uh, humility and wisdom. And we know that we can only thank you for all those good things, O oh God. It's not because he's a perfect man, but it's because he's created by a perfect father who placed him in authority. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that he's been trying by all means to do what you called him to do. We thank you for his leadership, Father. We know that it hasn't been easy. We pray that you may continue strengthening them, comforting them, and protecting them, Lord, for our sake. And we also do pray that you may also bring them closer to you, oh, Father, uh, during this kind time of uh, the virus, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you we are known by you and we know you. We do pray that for those who don't know you, they may come closer to you, O oh Father. And we do pray, Lord Jesus, that you may open our hearts and open our minds to serve wholeheartedly wherever we can, however we can. We do pray, O oh my gracious Father, that you, you may be greater and we may become less by putting other people's needs before our needs, O oh Father. We know that it's, that's not easy. We can't do it on our own. We need your grace, O oh Father. We do pray, O oh much gracious Father, that we may deny ourselves just for your sake, Lord Jesus, because that's what you called us to do, for your glory and for your honor, Father. I do pray that you may lead us to our knees during this time. You may fill our hearts with gratitude and thanksgiving of all the good things that we have and other people do not have. We do pray, O oh gracious Father, that we may grow in our faith during this hard time and not grumble, but look at your goodness and also know that we are looking forward to a home where there won't be any suffering, but there will be joy. Suffering is only for now, but we're looking forward to a Father where we'll all be in the same scale of Father. For now, Lord, we come before you, comfort us, Console us and restore our broken soul to come closer to you. We pray that we may continuously be reminded that it is greater to live for you. It is better to live for you and knowing you, Lord. I do pray that you may hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, church. Today we're going to be reading from Mark chapter 8 verses 27 to 9, verse 1. Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? They answered him, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. And he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. 
Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed and rise after three days. He spoke openly about this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Then he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. This is the word of the Lord. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really good to be here with you again. If you don't know me, my name is Mundy. And I'm one of the pastors of Christchurch Cascades. And I'm uh, nervously excited to be digging into this passage with you this afternoon. Uh, Jesus said many things that his disciples then and his disciples now find difficult or tricky. Either because we don't like what he says. But sometimes I think because if we start thinking about them deeply, it would challenge us, challenge us more than we're comfortable with. Jesus is often much more hard-hitting than we think. And one of the most challenging things he says to those who would be his disciples is what we found in our passage today. He says, deny yourself. Self-denial. We put the word self in front of things like identity, uh, actualization, fulfillment, um, love, acceptance... And he never does that. He only ever puts the word self in front of denial. Deny yourself. And in so doing, he challenges the very heart of our culture. He challenges what we aim for, hope for, what motivational posters in classrooms tell our kids or tell you if if you're a kid in a classroom. He uh, challenges what movies tell us. And if we're honest, what we probably want for our children as parents. He says we have to deny ourselves and lose ourselves if we truly want to have life. Now, why this is so challenging beyond what we're comfortable with, if you're not challenged enough already, is that we can look at that phrase and go, whew, this is hectic. It seems a little bit too spiritual for me, and I'm just going to brush it off. I know what he says, but I I can't think of that so much, so I'm going to just let it go. And that is what's made me extremely uncomfortable with this passage this week, uncomfortable with my discipleship. Is this what I do? And so I think I need help, and and we need help as we look at Mark chapter 8. And I'm going to pray for us and ask God to um, allow us to reflect properly on what Jesus says. Let's pray. Father, by your word, you created the universe. It is your word who came and dwelt amongst us. It is your word, Jesus, to whom we need to listen and take seriously. So I pray that you would enable us by your spirit today to give proper thought to what he means by denying ourselves, to think about what it means to be his disciple and to grab hold 
of the life he offers us. We ask this in his name. Amen. Now I want us to briefly look at where we are in this gospel because it's important for us in how we shape Jesus' words about denying ourselves. So follow with me just very briefly. In verse 27, Jesus is with his disciples and he asks them the question, Who do people say that I am? And they give a variety of responses. Uh, and then he asks the question that he asks all of us to think about. Who do you say I am? Peter responds for the disciples and he answers him and says, you are the Messiah. That's the Hebrew word for Christ. It means anointed one. What Peter is basically saying here is he says, we believe that you are the king God had promised to give his people. Throughout the Old Testament, God had been promising a Messiah to his people. You find it in places like Psalm 2. You can go there and read that. God has given the world a king, and Peter says, Jesus, we believe you are that king. And that will explain why when Jesus immediately after that starts teaching his disciples that he must suffer and die, have a look at verse 31, he began to teach them it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed and rise after three days. When he starts teaching them that, it explains why Peter rebukes him. Peter is shocked. Peter is basically saying, Jesus, you've got your Bible wrong. The king of Psalm 2, the son of man, that's from a book called Daniel, they are figures of global authority and power and rule. The old world is, word is dominion. And they're saying, no, Jesus, that's not the Messiah we're expecting. What kind of king comes to die? But then Jesus turns around and rebukes Peter. Saying, get behind me, Satan, you're thinking about the things of man, not the things of God. In other words, Jesus is saying, you've got it wrong, Peter. Humanity expects kings or rulers who are powerful, who rule with an iron fist and, 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 and lord it over people. But that is not what God wants from kings. This is what God intends from his king. So now we've got the idea that Jesus is king. We've got the idea that Jesus is a suffering and dying king. He is the king who denies himself for the good of his people. That's what we saw at Easter, isn't it? He's the king who, who, who comes to bear the punishment of rebellion, uh, reserved for the rebellion of his people. Just think about that for a moment. It's, it's amazing. You rebel against the king. He comes and takes the punishment for treason that you deserve. That's what Jesus does. Okay, so he is the king, and he is a suffering king. So, when he calls, in verse 34, his disciples, and notice he's got the crowds there as well. This is what everyone needs to hear. When he calls them together, he has this to say about what he wants from his people, what he wants from his subjects. He says, if anyone wants to follow after me, that's what a disciple is. He's someone who follows in the footsteps of his master. If anyone wants to follow after me, then this needs to happen. You need to deny yourself and you need to take up your cross. What does this mean? Well, if we're following Jesus, we take a lead from him. What did it mean for him? To deny himself. Well, big picture, it means living for God's kingdom and not your own. It means... Putting God's priorities in place above your own. Not my will, but yours. It means subjecting all of who you are and what you do under the rule of God and His King Jesus. Already this is uncomfortable. We don't want to subject anything of ours to anyone. But it does point out for us the fact that even for those who do follow Jesus, because remember the disciples are here with the crowd as well, we are going to have competing interests. You will have a life that is filled with your interests and Jesus' interests. And the disciple will deny his own. You to deny yourself. Second thing is take up your cross. This is a phrase that we in the English language have domesticated totally. It doesn't mean, 
you know, the little burdens that we have to bear. Oh, that's just my cross to bear, we say. You know, what has Jesus just told his disciples? He's told them that he will take up his cross, he will die. The cross is a symbol of death. Do you want to follow Jesus? Well, die to yourself. Deny yourself to the point that you die to those competing interests. That your whole life shifts focus from what it was to something totally different. Now I know if you're listening in at this point and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, this does not sound very appealing. It might be a little uh, shocking for those of us who call ourselves Christians. But Jesus does go on to say that in doing this, in, in losing your life, you will actually save it. Look at verse 35. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. Now I mentioned at the beginning that we're all taught to strive for self-fulfillment, etc. We're told in, in movies, especially these days, that we are to look inside of ourselves to find what makes us who we truly are. When Jesus uses the word life here, it's more than a matter of life and death, you know, living or dying. It's the Greek word psyche or suche, from which we get psychology. It's a word that encompasses our being, our identity, our personality. It's what makes you, you. And every culture at every time has its goals for defining what makes you, you. In South Africa, we live in a quite a sort of weird mix of traditional and modern. So, so what, defining what makes you you um, varies a lot. It can be quite traditional in the sense that it's your work. You're defined by what you do. You're defined by whether you're married or not. You know, we, we're traditional enough that those who are not married are wrongly made to feel like they're not living up to their full potential, or not who they can truly be. Uh, but... The modern influence means that we're often defining ourselves by our sexuality or by our individuality um, or our legacy. More and more we're being pushed into thinking that we have to be great at what we do. We must excel, otherwise we're not living up to our potential, we're not making the most of ourself and we're not going to leave anything behind. That creates so much anxiety. I actually sometimes wonder whether the anxiety, levels of anxiety we have in our society are because we have this real pressure we put on ourselves. Even in Christian circles, there is this unhealthy undercurrent that calls for greatness in discipleship. We're told to perform, to achieve, to do better at, at doing good so that we somehow feel like we are living up to a standard. You know, in, in Africa we have this strange thing where pastors want to be known as great men of God. And they give themselves fancy titles. It's just using Christianity to build self-identity. And whatever that looks like for you, perhaps it's your parenting. Jesus says, what good is it? You gain all of that, but you actually lose your life. These things will swallow your life. They won't give you life. And this is the difficult part, uh, for me at least, about Jesus' words here. He says, whatever you want to build your identity on, whether it is work or relationship or your religiousness, I think that's a made up word, uh, wherever you think you're going to make your mark, it's not actually going to give you life. It's not going to make you who you are meant to be. Whoever wants to save his identity, in other words, hold on to it and create with it or in it what you want, you will lose it. You won't be who you were truly made to be. Unless you lose it for Jesus. Whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. That is what is meant by follow me. Turn away from all these other things that you think you need or want to make you you and follow Jesus. Now, it's not just giving up things that are dear to you. It's giving them up for something better. Because it is in Jesus and the gospel, he links the two. 
that, uh, himself to the gospel. It's in Jesus and the gospel that we find out who we truly are and who God has truly made us to be. It's in the gospel that we find out that we are humans created in the image of God with value and dignity. It's in the gospel that we find out that even though we have this value, we are rebellious, sinful humans. So much so that God the Son had to come and die to sort that out. But it is in the gospel that we find out that we are loved by the same God we have rebelled against. So much so that God the Son chose to come with the purpose of suffering and dying for your life, your psyche, your identity, to give you what you truly need, God. I feel I need to take a deep breath. That's a lot to take in, isn't it? Let's take a pause. But it's when you understand the facts that Jesus is King, God's King for us, and that He's a King who is willing to deny Himself for you, give His all for you, then following Him in this way becomes doable. When you realize that you are so loved by the only one who truly matters, that you don't have to perform for yourself or for your family or society anymore, you can really live. You know, the verdict's been given. You are loved. And you don't have to earn it anymore. You can live for others like Jesus did without expecting anything in return, without chalking up tick marks for your performance or your legacy. You can just live for them. You can live for the joy of living and not the pressure of performing. In these verses, Jesus refers to himself twice as the Son of Man. As I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a figure, a title given to someone in the Old Testament to whom God gives all authority and dominion to judge and rule the universe. But the first mention of the Son of Man is when Jesus talks of himself as having to suffer and die. And the second one, coming in verse 38, did you see that at the end? Is when he speaks of his ultimate glorious return. The Son of Man suffers first, before there is glory. And if we are to follow him, then that is the path we will take as well. Self-denial is the suffering. Glory later. Life later. Now, for many people, this is not the Jesus they want. It wasn't the Jesus Peter wanted. That's why he was ashamed of Jesus' words. It's not the Jesus people want if they want their best life now. And they want prosperity now. You don't want to deny yourself. You want Jesus to give you the things you want. So it's not the Jesus you want if he's your insurance policy. You know, live life any way you want it now as long as you've got eternity sorted. Or if he's your genie in the bottle to give you all the things you want. There's this illustration, uh, you've probably heard it before, I can't remember uh, where it comes from. It's where you sort of ask Jesus to take the wheel of your life. Take the wheel, Jesus, you say. Um, where that illustration falls down is that inadvertently we start seeing Jesus as our driver to take us where we want him to take us. Our car is going where we want to go. And Jesus becomes driving this daisy. Discipleship, following Jesus, as he speaks of here, is getting out of your car, climbing into the passenger seat of his car, and going where he wants to lead you. I am going with you, Jesus, you say. You know, if Jesus is your genie in a bottle, and the life of self-denial is one that you're not willing to take on, you call yourself a Christian, but you wouldn't say this is you. And friends, you are, you are like Peter in these verses, and you're ashamed of the words that Jesus has uttered. Those are what he's speaking of in verse 38. If you are ashamed of my words, that I am the suffering, dying king, then there is a warning. You know, 
know, he does speak about the great reward of life, the real you, for eternity. If you follow Jesus as he presents himself, but if you follow Jesus of your own making, there is the warning that you might fool yourself and you might fool others, but you won't fool him. And he will be ashamed of you on the day he comes back. He will not claim you as his, as you have not claimed the real him as yours. So there is a, a challenge for us this afternoon. Um, two, two challenges and one question we have to really grapple with and wrestle with. These are the challenges. Number one, is the Jesus I'm following, this Jesus, the suffering King? Number two, have I subjected my life to his rule? And, and let's be careful here. Not have I made him my ally in attaining the things I want, my divine service provider. But have I subjected my life to his rule? And in the question for all of us, and this is what you want to wrestle with as a Christian or as someone who might not be one, is do I understand the depth of love Jesus has for me? You know, we, we live in a politically volatile country, right? It's actually been blissfully politically quiet at the moment. But, but we have opposition parties because the people who run those parties or who vote for those parties don't think that the ruling party has their best interests at heart. So they oppose. If I don't feel like Jesus has my best interest at heart, I will be the opposition party in my own life. And I will do things that I think are best. If I don't think that what Jesus is doing there, or the road Jesus is leading me down here, is one that a loving uh, king is leading me down, I will go, oh, no thank you, I would rather go this way. But when I truly begin to grab hold in my head and my heart, my psyche, of the height and depth and width and length of the love of Jesus for me, I will begin to let go of my opposition and truly follow after him. I will begin to say, I don't understand what you're doing here. Don't know why we're going down this road, but I know you love me. I know you're going to do things that are good for me ultimately, so I'm following you. Now, just a quick last aside, this is a lifelong thing. None of us perfectly follow the king from the word go. And there will be areas of your life that you might not even be aware of right now, are little zones of rebellion or self-centeredness. But and here's the challenging thing I spoke of in the beginning. This is something we need to think about and pray about and wrestle with. And not just brush this text off as being for the super spiritual. Jesus says in these verses, if anyone were to follow after me, this is what they are to do. Someone who got this was Paul the Apostle, who would write in a letter to a church in Galatia. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I no longer live, I have denied self. And he, then he goes on to say, the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This, friends, is the king who calls you to follow, who calls you to deny self. He is the king who truly loves you and gave himself for you, so that you could be the real you and be that for eternity. Take a moment um, to speak to Jesus, whether it's something that you want to say sorry for, something you want to thank him for, or, or whether you want him to help you to follow him like this. Um, I'm going to be quiet. You can pray by yourself for a moment, and then I'll hand back to Alberto. You. Thank you, Mandy. It is not often that I deny myself and put others first. We are so good at loving ourselves, putting our needs first and not our neighbors. We're going to close the service in one last song, Grace Unmeasured. 
we have to thank Sovereign Grace Music for allowing us to use their songs. Listen to these words. Grace abounding strong and true, that makes me long to be like you, that turns me from my selfish pride to love the cross on which you died. Join us again next week as we meet together the same time and the same place. Consider inviting one of your friends or colleagues to join us as well. Let's close this service in prayer. Our Father God, we thank you that you love us, you offered grace to us, and that you modeled perfect selflessness on the cross for us. We pray you be with us this week. And bring us together again next. In your name we pray. Amen.